Tenakoto Katoa, Nao Mai Haere Mai, Ko Gina Ju Toku Ingoa, He Mehi Ki Te Mana Whenua Ko Te Ate Awa. Welcome to the Moa Point Sludge Minimisation Facility webinar. I have acknowledged Te Ate Awa as Mana Whenua of Poneki Wellington. When we think about the focus of tonight's webinar, the proposed new sludge minimisation facility at Moa Point, the purpose of this new facility is very much about kaitiakitanga, the need to protect and look after the environment. It will be a transformational change in the way we are able to dispose of the city's sewage sludge, reducing the volume of sewage sludge going to the landfill by 80%. It will help the Council meet its targets of halving its emissions by 2030 and becoming a net zero carbon capital by 2050. Tonight's webinar is an opportunity to learn more about the proposed new facility and how it works, as well as the construction and consenting, the activity that will happen during construction, operation and during the use of the site. We also have our team of experts here available to answer your questions. Before we hear from our speakers, I'd like to run through the agenda and some housekeeping for this evening. In terms of the question process, the webinar is going to run for about an hour. You can ask your questions throughout the webinar by submitting a question through the Slido tool uh, on screen during the webinar. I'll put as many of these questions as we can to our experts tonight. Answers to all the questions will be posted on the Let's Talk Wellington website in the next couple of days. So if we don't have time to get all, to all of the questions tonight, the answers will be available on the website. A video recording of this webinar will also be uploaded to the Wellington City Council's Let Talk, Let's Talk website as soon as possible after the event. It does take a bit of time uh, to add the captions, uh, but you can expect to see it there in, in the next few days. Shortly, I'll introduce tonight's speakers who will give a presentation about the proposed new facility, how it works, the consenting process and the environmental impacts. They'll also cover off how to have your say by making a submission and will run through next steps in the timeline so you know what happens after the consultation finishes. We'll then move on to your questions. Firstly though, I'd like to introduce uh, our speakers. Siobhan Proctor is the Chief uh, Infrastructure Officer for the Wellington City Council. Now, Siobhan has worked in both the electricity and transport sectors before joining Wellington City Council to take on responsibility for the city's roading, property, waste and water assets. Siobhan is the project sponsor for the sludge minimisation project. I've got Chris French next to me here. Chris is the Wellington City Council's Technical Director for the Wellington Sludge Minimisation Project and is responsible for, for providing overall direction to the design and construction team for the project. Chris is a specialist in wastewater treatment systems and has over 20 years experience in the design and project management of sludge treatment processes and has worked on projects across New Zealand, the UK, North America and the Pacific. Chris especially enjoys the opportunity to make connections with the communities he works with and to create meaningful environmental improvements for current and future generations. Paul McGimsey. Paul is a proudly born and bred Wellingtonian. He is leading the planning team at Becker that has prepared the Notice of Requirement and Assessment of Environmental Effects. Throughout his career he has worked on a range of infrastructure projects locally as well as across New Zealand and internationally. Recent local projects he's been involved with include the Transmission Gully Motorway, the Nauronga to Patoni Shared Walking and Cycling Path and the Porirua Wastewater Storage Tank. Now, Siobhan um, Proctor would like to have been here tonight for the webinar. Unfortunately, she had a prior engagement um, and so was unable to attend in person. She did um, pre-record uh, some brief comments, um, which we're going to watch next, um, where she talks about where this particular project fits in terms of the city's zero waste vision. Wellington City Council is committed to making Wellington a sustainable eco-city through low carbon transport, sustainable homes and buildings, and waste reduction. Through our climate action plan, Te Atakura, First to Zero, we've committed to halving carbon emissions by 2030 and becoming a net zero carbon capital by 2050. Waste is a big contributor to the city's carbon emissions, and we've committed to reducing the volume of waste going to landfill by a third by 2026. 
Sludge is a natural byproduct of treating our sewage. It's pretty nasty and smelly stuff, and we currently dispose of it at our southern landfill, where we're required to mix it with four parts waste to one part sludge. That's a condition of our resource consent, and that resource consent expires in June 2026, after which time it is highly unlikely we're going to be able to dispose of our sludge at the landfill, expect, except under emergency circumstances. So that leaves us with the problem of what to do with this product, which is a byproduct of human waste, which we can't stop um, producing. After significant options analysis and business casing, our council in June this year approved a lysis digestion with thermal drying sludge facility to be built at Moor Point. Ultimately, we're trying to create a step change in waste management and minimization by shifting our focus to the waste hierarchy, where we aim to reduce as much of our waste as possible. The sludge minimization facility is a key enabler of our zero waste vision, and we have a great design and delivery team working on making it a reality by June 2026. Heading up our design team is Chris French, and he's now going to talk to you a little bit more about the sludge minimization facility. Thanks, Siobhan. Uh, so, as Siobhan alluded to, we are currently taking the sludge, which is a byproduct from the Moa Point and Karori wastewater treatment plants and we're not really doing any treatment to it other than taking some water out of it in a process called dewatering before we put it in the southern landfill. Now, the sludge from the Moa Point plant, which is the biggest of our plants, is piped across the city, across the southern suburbs, to, uh, to the landfill where there is a dewatering facility. And sludge from the Karori plant is dewatered at Karori and then uh, trucked to the landfill. There are a few challenges with this. Uh, first of all, we have fragile infrastructure, and that was really highlighted by the by the failure of the pipelines, the sludge transfer pipelines in southern Wellington uh, in 2020. Uh, and we need to do significant work to upgrade our infrastructure if we're not replacing it. Because of the nature of the sludge as that smelly, odorous, uh, unstable product, the only option we have for its disposal moment is the landfill. And as Siobhan alluded to, um, we need to mix it with solid waste to manage that smelly, odorous material. Um, so we can't minimise our solid waste going to landfill until we really deal with that sludge. Another thing about sludge is that uh, when it's in the landfill, it attracts rodents and uh, seagulls and other vectors, um, and it produces lots of odour and carbon emissions as it breaks down in the landfill because we've given it no prior treatment to stop that. Next slide. So I'm just going to talk briefly about how the sludge treatment process works. And as I said, Moa Point is the largest of our treatment plants. It receives about 95% of Wellington's wastewater and therefore produces about 95% of the sludge. So it's naturally we're going to locate it there, uh, which increases significantly the resilience of the whole process. And then we import uh, sludge uh, in a tanker from uh, from Karori, uh, which is only a small amount of the total. But really talking about the treatment process, um, it, it's a three-stage process, and at the heart of it is the digestion process. Now, the digestion process is, is essentially involves tanks that are filled with the sludge. They uh, use special bugs to break down the sludge uh, and it, 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 under controlled conditions. And as the sludge breaks down, it goes through what's called stabilization, uh, where it, it, where it, uh, the, the, the sludge and the digestion is being broken down in a, in, and biodegraded, rather than that occurring in the environment. When that occurs, uh, biogas, which is a methane-rich gas, is given off as a result, and we capture all that and we use that beneficially. The special thing about this plant is that we're putting a thermal hydrolysis process in front of the digesters. The reason we do that is that it pressure cooks the sludge and makes it far easier for the bugs in those digesters to consume or metabolise. Essentially, a thermal hydrolysis plant is a pressure cooker. It takes the raw sludge product and it, uh, it pressure cooks it, breaks it down uh, so it makes it far more digestible. And then the final stage of process after digestion is thermal drying. And essentially what that's doing is baking off all of the uh, water in the sludge so that we produce a dried product. So at the end of this process, the sludge is both stabilised, um, meaning it's less susceptible to breaking down biodegrading in the landfill uh, or, or in alternative uses. 
and it's dry. So the carbon involved in transporting it to its end use is far, far reduced. The other great thing about this process is that all that biogas from the digesters is captured and it is used to generate steam for the thermal hydrolysis plant, heat for the thermal drying plant, and we have enough biogas to produce electricity as well. So we don't need fossil fuels to run this plant once it's up and running. Uh, and we generate some electricity from it too. Next slide. Uh, so I just thought I'd share a few photos um, from ex other plants around the globe that use this sort of technology. And what you'll notice in most of these photos is that the, the process is entirely indoors in very clean facilities. Uh, and that's very typical of sludge processes. Uh, they, are, they are enclosed processes, which allows us to capture all of the odor that comes off the treatment process, and then we treat it through a high-tech treatment process. So the first picture on the top middle is uh, sludge screening. What that's doing is that it's taking out little bits of fine debris that might be in the sludge, things like cotton bud tips, toothpicks, things like that, that might have been flushed down the sewers uh, and end up in our sludge. And we do that so we don't harm the very expensive uh, processes that we have um, to, to treat the sludge. The second photo, top right, uh, is a photo of our centrifuges and what they do is they are taking some water out of the sludge before we put it through the thermal hydrolysis plant. The third photo in the bottom left is a photo of a thermal hydrolysis plant. So the t little st stainless steel tanks you can see there are the reactors that are pressure cooking the sludge. Again, it's an enclosed controlled process um, housed within inside a building. The bottom middle picture is a picture of digesters. As you can see, they're tanks, and they have those covers on them. Those covers are where the biogas is collected, so they're completely enclosed tanks uh, that we use to, to digest the sludge. And then the final picture in the bottom right is a picture of a thermal dryer. Um, that's the one that's baking off the water from the sludge. Again, that's an enclosed process, a very sort of clean process, uh, and that's producing that final product. I'm now going to hand over to Paul, who's going to talk about the planning aspects. Thanks a lot, Chris. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to start off just by giving an overview of a notice of requirement and designation. Um, so look, a notice of requirement uh, leads to a designation, uh, and a designation is quite a unique planning instrument uh, that's really used for public works, like we're looking at here, uh, a wastewater facility, but you'll also see it used for railways and, and highways and so on. Um, in this case, um, we actually have a designation over most of the uh, sludge minimisation facility site. And that designation was put uh, on the site about 30 years ago to provide for the Moa Point uh, treatment facility, which sits above our site. Um, so what we're actually doing is altering the existing designation. Um, and that involves adding a little bit of land to it to provide for all of the area that we need for our facility, uh, as well as changing some of the conditions um, so that they're appropriate and adequately cover uh, and uh, address the environmental effects that our facility will have. Um, what we're also making sure is that there's an element of flexibility within that designation, uh, recognising that uh, there's still some design work to be done. Uh, at the moment, we're at a relatively high level of design, uh, but between now and construction, that design will continue to be refined uh, by Chris and his design team. In terms of the content of a Notice of Requirement, um, all of the documents are publicly available on, on the website, and the document you see there on, on the right um, is the main Notice of Requirement, uh, which runs to 100 or so pages, and then behind that there's probably uh, several hundred more pages of much more detailed technical environmental assessments if people um, are interested in those. Um, the key things that we do in the Notice of Requirement, uh, like a res resource consent, um, are assess the effects of the environment on the environment of the proposal. Um, we need to look at the relevant planning documents, and so here that's the district plan, both the operative one as well as the newly proposed plan. Um, we also document the process that was gone through to arrive at the pr uh, preferred solution. Um, so that's the process that Chris and the team went through from a, an initial long list of about 25 different process and location options down to the preferred option uh, that we're seeking permission to build here now. 
Um, what we end up with on the condition, uh, on the designation, is a set of conditions uh, to manage the environmental effects. And I'll talk a little bit in a moment about some of those key environmental effects. Um, the final decision, this is where uh, the process does differ a little bit from a resource consent. Um, what is likely to happen here is that Wellington City Council uh, will appoint an independent commissioner, uh, and that commissioner will be independent of council. Uh, they will be accredited by, through the Ministry for the Environment's uh, Making Good Decisions program. Uh, it may be one commissioner or it may be a panel um, of, of potentially three. And that will depend a little bit on um, the quantity and nature of submissions that council receives on, on this notice of requirement. Um, what that commissioner or panel of commissioners does is makes a recommendation to council. Um, but an important point on a notice of requirement is that the final decision on it uh, does rest with council and council will vote on that. And um, we'll come on a little bit to the timeframes that we anticipate these uh, key, uh, key activities occurring. Uh, just to note that while we're here today talking around the notice of requirement, there are a suite of other consents needed. Um, those are from the regional council and they cover things like operational stormwater, uh, earthworks uh, and dis discharge of odour. Um, we also require a wildlife permit uh, from DOC in relation to uh, some lizards that have been found on the slopes uh, towards the back of our site there. Um, next slide. So this is very much a whirlwind tour of the environmental impacts. As I said, there's a lot more detail in the online documents if you would like to get into that. Um, I think one thing to bear in mind is that there are some really positive environmental effects from this proposal. Um, and Chris has spoken a little bit in Siobhan generally about some of them. Um, but as a result of this, uh, total volumes of sludge to landfill will reduce by 80%. Um, one uh, really positive element of that, uh, of course, is it frees up really valuable landfill space, um, which as we know uh, is, is under pressure here in Wellington City. Um, it reduces greenhouse gas emissions from our current sludge disposal uh, system by about over 60%, about 63%. Um, it eliminates the odour associated with our current disposal method at Southern Landfill in Kerry's Gully. Um, and as Chris alluded to, it removes our reliance on those pipelines which um, have failed uh, on a few occasions and most recently in 2020. Um, in terms of other environmental effects, um, air quality, uh, what we're looking at here is making sure that we manage the potential uh, for dust, both during construction from our earthworks, uh, as well as during operation, uh, which is predominantly um, when we come to load the final product, which are known as stabilised biosolids, from our hoppers um, into trucks to be taken off site. Uh, we do that in an enclosed space with the roller doors down, um, at negative pressure, so we're, we're able to draw off the dust. Uh, so th those are the main ways that we manage that. As Chris alluded to, uh, all of the, the kit that is, is involved in this process is enclosed within buildings. What that allows us to do in terms of odour is make sure that we um, capture all of that odour and put it through a really um, high-tech, high-performance odour treatment system. Um, as a result, our um, odour modelling has given us confidence that um, at residential receptors uh, in the area there will be no offensive or objectionable odour um, at all. In terms of landscape and visual effects, um, the, the landscape that we're looking at here is quite highly modified. Um, the area was uh, quarried from about the 1950s onwards. We've obviously got substantial airport uh, development in close proximity, so we are dealing with a highly modified environment. And the overall landscape effects have been assessed as being uh, moderate to low. The project and, and, and the works will be visible, and there's no getting away from that. And what you see there on screen is a, a, a visualisation um, from the public walking track about halfway down from uh, Kekaringa Street down to Stuart Duff Drive. What I would point out there is that the colour scheme we've given it there is not the final colour scheme that we will use. We've just used a reasonably matte grey for the purposes of the visual simulation. Um, what we will do in terms of reducing those landscape and visual uh, effects is look to use um, 
uh, recessive colours, so these are often quite earthy colours that perhaps mimic some of the surrounding co uh, natural colours that, that we find on the uh, former quarry um, uh, face, um, as well as use low reflectivity materials as well, so not lots of shiny surfaces. Um, that's for to reduce visual impacts, uh, but it's also really important in terms of the proximity uh, of our facility next to the airport. And we've got a whole lot of restrictions around how high we can go, how reflective our surfaces can be, um, to make sure that we don't interfere with the safety of the airport, which is obviously absolutely paramount. Um, in terms of ecology there, um, uh, quite a low potential for seabirds, including penguins. Um, but we have found a number of lizards on site. These are two particular species, uh, the northern grass skink and the Ruakaka gecko. Uh, both of these species are very common uh, throughout the Lower North Island and they're, and they're not classified as at risk or threatened. Um, nonetheless, um, before we start construction on those slopes, um, we are going to look to um, gather up as many of those lizards uh, as we can and relocate them to adjacent council reserves. Um, in terms of noise and vibration, uh, during construction, um, daytime uh, construction noise will be within the limits of the relevant New Zealand standard, uh, which is 6803. Um, throughout the four-year construction period, there will probably be between five and ten instances uh, where we will need to do works overnight. Um, and so what we'll need to do there uh, is make sure that we're giving the community uh, plenty of notice about what they can expect in terms of noise levels for how long. Um, and those will be associated with some key activities like continuous concrete pours and, and the like. Um, in terms of once the facility is operational, um, all of our noise limits will be within, um, uh, all of our noise levels rather will be within the relevant district plan noise limits. Again, all of our kit is fully enclosed and we do some things like put the noisiest bits of kit right in the very centre of our buildings uh, and probably further encase them as well to provide um, addis additional uh, noise attenuation. Uh, during um, construction, uh, there's obviously going to be some uh, traffic. Um, day to day, the uh, traffic volumes during construction are going to be relatively modest, sort of 5 to 14 daily truck movements um, across the construction period. Um, but for some uh, specific activities, such as those continuous concrete pours that I mentioned, those numbers will be quite a bit higher. Uh, and again, a lot of managing that is... Um, being really clear in our communications with the community around when this activity is likely to occur and for how long, uh, so, so that people are, are well informed uh, about this. Um, and we'll obviously need to coordinate closely with, with WILE as well on that. Uh, during operation, uh, traffic uh, numbers are, are quite modest again. Uh, we're looking at seven trucks per day to, to uh, take the um, uh, dried, stabilised biosolids away as well as deliver sludge from Karori and about six vehicles per day just for on-site staff, so, so pretty low numbers. Um, and just finally on environmental effects, uh, flooding and stormwater is, is something that we've looked at. Uh, in terms of our flood modelling, we're not increasing uh, the flood risk either to our site or to surrounding sites. Um, all of our stormwater runoff from the site will go through a level of treatment before uh, connecting into the existing stormwater network. Uh, down Stuart Duff Drive, uh, and we'll have uh, bunding around uh, things like our digesters so that in the event that there is a spillage or there's a, a failure of those, um, we've got a system in place such that we, we will be able to contain that material and it won't be going straight uh, into, into the uh, stormwater network. Next one. So this slide here is just setting out uh, the process uh, in terms of, of having your say. Um, we've got a, a, an in-person session uh, on Sunday, the, the 18th, at the Ruakawa uh, Community Centre there in Strathmore, and certainly uh, encourage people to come along to that. I think Chris and I will both be there in person, perhaps probably as well as a few others. Uh, the web link there, as I said, the documents that I've uh, referred to are all publicly, publicly available there including the really detailed environmental assessments. Um, and just to reiterate that the submissions close uh, on Friday the 23rd of September. <clears throat> uh, once the submission period closes in terms of what happens from, from there on in, uh, depending, as I said, on the number of submissions and the nature of those submissions, uh, will uh, determine uh, how many uh, independent commissioners 
Wellington City Council appoints. Um, if a hearing is needed, then that's likely to be towards the back end of November, we think. Um, and about a month or so afterwards, uh, that hearings panel will make its recommendation. Uh, and then ultimately, Council will vote on that, uh, which is likely to be about February next year. Kia ora. Thank you for that overview. Now, we've received a, a good number of questions, um, so I'll ask uh, Chris and Paul to respond to as many of them as possible. The first question that we've got is, what will the dried waste product be used for? And I'll ask Chris to respond to that question. Thanks, Gina. Yeah, so the, uh, the, the dried product, one of the exciting things I think about this project is the potential to use that dried waste product. So, so internationally, um, treated dried biosolids like this are used in a number of ways, including as fertiliser in agriculture, as fuel in industrial processes, uh, and, and even novel things like putting it into uh, asphalt for roads. Um, so what we're going to do is we're commencing a, a parallel work stream of work beside uh, the, the sludge process, which is about treating the problem we have now, um, to work with our iwi partners and uh, technical specialists and scientists and work through what the possible options are for us in the Wellington region. Uh, and then we will be going through a public consultation process around that uh, at some point in the future. OK, thanks, Chris. We've got a question now from Michael. Um, if the sludge minimisation project goes ahead, does this mean the existing pipe to the landfill can be retired? If so, what is the expected saving per annum against the annual cost of running the sludge, sludge minimisation facility? I think that one's... For you too, yeah, Chris? absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so yes, we will be retiring those existing pipes, um, uh, which is a, a great outcome in terms of infrastructure resilience. Uh, I haven't got the numbers to hand about how we can, um, how much we will save in pumping that sludge, because there's obviously an electricity cost that goes with pumping that sludge. But I'll look into that and I'll get that uh, get that up online. Yeah. Great, great. Um, the next question um, is, are the outdoor digester tanks similar to the Christchurch ones damaged by fire and still causing smell in the community down there? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, no, these are not. So the, 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 the tanks that were damaged in the Christchurch fire were actually in the liquid wastewater treatment plant. Our plants in... Uh, our plants in uh, Wellington don't have those same tanks. So those tanks are called trickling filters and we don't have those. The digesters are entirely different. Christchurch has digesters and I can tell you uh, they definitely did not catch fire. Uh, so, so no, they are not the same. So um, we won't have any of those problems that no, had in Otatahi. <laughs> so um, Carlo would like to know, does the facilities uh, need to mitigate H2S? Yeah, hydrogen sulphide. So, so H2S is hydrogen sulphide. It's naturally given off in, um, in, in treatment processes, and it is contained in small amounts in the biogas that comes off the digester, uh, off the digesters. So what we will do is we will treat that to remove it. We have to remove that, and interestingly, some other components like siloxanes. Now, siloxanes are, interestingly, they come from... Um, shampoos and other uh, and makeup and things that gets flushed down the sewers and ends up in our sludge. We have to remove those to actually protect our equipment. I said we're going to be producing electricity um, in order to protect the, the engines that produce that electricity. Um, from those we have to remove and strip that out. So it is consciously part of our treatment process. Great. Amy uh, says the sludge minimisation facility has a capacity of 17,500 DS tonnes per week. Could, could, we, could it be at capacity by 2073? Mm -hmm. Do you think the per capita figure used in the report is a little conservative given EU and US states use a higher value DS per capita mm -hmm. than used in Connect Water 2021? Now there's quite a technical question uh, there. Yeah, yeah. Perhaps you can sort of elaborate yeah, yeah, on what the question's yeah, yeah. So, asking. So, so essentially um, the way we normally figure out sludge uh, volumes is by uh, DS or dry solids. So each person produces amount of dry solids per per person per day, and we use that to calculate or per week, and we use that to calculate how much sludge we would expect to be produced. Actually, what we have done is we've used actual sludge figures because we're already producing sludge it's just not in the form we like um, and we've gone through a number of population projections so done a huge amount of um, of sensitivity analysis now um, 
One of the great things about the plant is that um, as, as the plant uh, ages, we'll be replacing bits, and we've allowed for the ability to either increase or decrease the size, depending on how much population increase is actually realised over time um, to get uh, getting to 2073. Uh, 2073 has been chosen because it's a 50-year design horizon uh, for the plant, um, and in line with sort of the, the overall capacity of the Mower Point Waste or Training Plant. So, um, yeah, that's why we've gone for that. Right, a lot of detailed analysis there. Yeah. Now, um, we've got a, a question here um, from Paul. What water will be discharged from the new plant into the Cook Strait? Uh, is that one for you, Paul? Yeah, I can, I can take that one. Um, the only water that will be discharged is stormwater runoff um, that, as I said, will be treated... Uh, and that will be discharged via the existing stormwater outfall on the other side of Mower Point Road. Um, there's absolutely no wastewater discharges to Cook Strait from this facility, and that's that's an important thing to uh, to keep in mind. Um, yeah, so hopefully that answers that one. Okay, yeah. great. Uh, another person is asking: Are there alternative options to this sludge minimisation facility? Yes, yeah, so we went through a quite an extensive process, starting with over 25 um, different options uh, and then working that down through quite a lot of detailed technical analysis, financial analysis uh, and analysis against things like environmental effects, um, cultural safety and other aspects to identify the preferred option. Um, and so we got together a panel of uh, iwi, technical uh, and council and Wellington Water experts to work through and identify the best option as a balance of all those. Certainly there could be alternatives, but we felt like the option we've selected provides the best all-round solution against the factors which are important to Wellingtonians um, around how we manage our sludge. OK, great. Uh, have we got another question coming up here? We've, we've answered the three that are on screen. We've got another one that might pop up. Oh, here we go. Has um, serious investigations been made into thorough treatment and discharge to the deep waters of the Cook Strait after consultations with iwi? At best, 80% of the sludge will be dewatered and still 20% will still need to be landfilled. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'll ha have to look further into that question and perhaps the person who's asked that question come into the drop-in session and I'm more than happy to talk through. I don't quite understand that question, but the, um, but uh, definitely 20% of our sludge will, will, will still... Um, if it, the fact, I think what they're saying there is that 20, after we've treated it, we'll still have 20% of the sludge left and that will still need to go to landfill. We are looking to actively get it out of, out, out of landfill. It is not generally accepted culturally or, or environmentally to, um, to send our sludge out to sea. That's certainly uh, not at all what we are looking to do. We, we feel that the best option is to treat the sludge as we've done. Right, great. Um, Carlo wants to know, do you need to upgrade electrical reticulation, particularly ring main unit? Yes, um, so that's a great question. Uh, we've been working with Wellington Electricity, um, which means that um, uh, to look at the, uh, the effects on the electrical network, including from the generation of electricity and what opportunities that might present to defer upgrades, in fact, for a long time. Um, there are a number of users in the area who are going to place high demands on electricity use, um, and so we've been working through to see what implications we might have and proactively planning for electrical upgrades as we work through our process. So we'll have local electrical upgrades, but we'll also have an effect on wider electrical upgrades, and we're just coordinating with Wellington Electricity through those. OK, great. Um, another person, uh, I think this question might be for you, Paul. Um, you say no discernible odour at the neighbouring houses. Does this mean that there will be odour closer to the plant? Yeah, so um, it's, it's important to be upfront that we're not saying there won't be any discernible odour at houses. Um, what we are following is the regional council's um, uh, standards that they have in, in their planning documents which say that at the boundary of those houses, that offence, uh, that odour shall not be offensive or objectionable. Um, and that's what we're making a commitment to doing and what our modelling is showing. So that's not the same as saying that there won't be any smell whatsoever. Um, having said that, uh, given the distances and what our modelling is showing, um, the, the, the likelihood of being able to smell it from those residential properties is really, really low. Um, 
if you walk along Stuart Duff Drive uh, and are really close to it during a specific part of the process, um, loadout perhaps, um, you may be able to discern some odour. Yep, and and we can't, um, you know, we, we can't rule that out at all. But in terms of at, at those houses, uh, absolutely nothing offensive or objectionable. Okay, right. Uh, another person would like to know how long will construction of the new facility take? Yes, yeah, so um, our consent for the um, for taking the sludge in its current form to landfill expires in June 2026. So we need to have the new facility up and running by then. So we are we are targeting to have construction complete by the end, largely complete by the end of 2025, so that we have six months to commission the plant. There'll obviously be some ongoing tidy up tasks and things as there always is with construction activity. Uh, so by mid 2026, it should all be uh, more or less wrapped up um, total construction, yeah. Okay. Amy would like to know what kind of geotechnical resilience has been allowed for in terms of the design, earthquake, landslide, um, etc. It's an interesting question. Mm. Yeah, so um, one of the things, one of the studies we've done is a seismic hazard assessment and a general um, general environmental hazards assessment. Uh, it is always front of mind when we're dealing with critical infrastructure like wastewater treatment um, that we appropriately allow for seismic hazards. So there is a, um, a quite a detailed assessment done by some um, very specialist engineers around that and I can, I can certainly attest the fact that a lot of work has been put into understanding earthquake risk, landslide risk. One of the things that we're doing for example is we're going to stabilise the slopes behind the facility to um, remove the risk of future landslides um, and the facility is built to standards um, to withstand certain levels of earthquakes and the like as I said because it's critical infrastructure. Um, Carl is asking, um, as to the dried waste it cannot be used on food related commercial growing for cultural and ethical and, and um, reasons. It must be remembered the previous sludge was used in a failed project of using it as garden co um, compost. It was toxic. Mm. Yeah, so uh, that's correct. It was used, uh, the sludge in Wellington used to be composted um, and uh, it, it, th that ceased to operate and the, and the end product from that. What we're talking about here is an entirely different product, um, but we need to ensure that whatever we do with the end product needs to be culturally safe uh, and needs to be uh, scientifically uh, uh, right for our environment. So we are going to be going through quite a lengthy process uh, with iwi and with appropriate environmental scientists to ensure that there are no effects like that. What I would say is it's, it's going to produce quite a different product to that composting product. Uh, it's entirely, an entirely different product uh, and, and it had challenges for entirely different reasons. Um, so we, um, and, and part of our thinking about the type of option we've chosen is to produce a far more suitable option. Um, in terms of commercial agricultural use, uh, there are some parts of the agricultural sector, like the dairy sector, that don't allow the use of biosolids, but there are other parts where, at present, um, biosolids from other plants is used um, in things like forestry, uh, in some horticulture. Um, so so uh, it's not banned from all commercial, um, commercial activity. Right. But okay. we, need to engage with, we need to engage with that sector to ensure that we do things in the right way. Right, yep. yes. Um, somebody else wants to know, have you considered refurbishing or reusing the existing facility that will be decommissioned? Yes, yeah, so we're in talks with the landfill about that building um, because they may have a use for the old buildings at Kerry's Gully for storage or other things uh, and or it could be that that area is affected by the landfill extension which is, which is subject to a completely different um, design and consenting process. Um, so we're in discussions about what we do with the old buildings at Kerry's Gully uh, and the old infrastructure there, yeah. Uh, somebody wants to know when is construction expected to start? Mm. So we're expecting to start uh, early next year. Um, so we would start with enabling works, uh, things like um, things like um, uh, earthworks and um, services and protection of existing services and slope stabilisation like is the sorts of um, activities that we would like to start um, to get our site prepared to begin building those buildings uh, sometime early next year. Right. Yeah. 
Um, Amy's asking what ratio needs to be met for the dry weight sludge to be landfilled, um, Southern Landfill Class A? Um, right, so there is uh, there is actually no dry weight requirement. Um, we, 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 you have to ideally aim for a, a, a sludge that is at least 20% dry, which means it's still got 80% of its moisture. The sludge that we're looking to produce uh, is, is close to 10% moisture, so 90% dry, uh, and that's... Um, not to do with uh, general landfill requirements, it's to do with specific operational constraints at Southern Landfill that we're trying to manage. Um, but yeah, so we need to meet a minimum 20 percent, but we're going far in excess of that because of specific constraints at Southern Landfill. Uh, and then on onwards, when we want to reuse it for other things, get it out of the landfill, um, it's better to be in that much drier state. Right. Uh, Carl asks, can you confirm projected costs and is this budgeted for by Wellington City Council? Yes, yeah, so we're currently working through uh, a cost estimation for the project and this project um, is, is subject to uh, uh, the Infrastructure Finance and Funding Act which is a special act that was um, brought in by central government in 2020 which can be used for funding critical infrastructure projects and the council um, is electing to use that to keep it off its um, its own balance sheet uh, because it needs um, its balance sheet for other things. So um, we are currently working through the cost estimates and we are going to be going to council uh, at, in December uh, to present our cost estimate and go through that approval process. Um, another person's asking, if I don't want to make a written submission, can I do it another way, e.g. is there going to be an oral hearing? Paul? Yeah, um, if somebody does want to appear at a hearing, they will need to have lodged a submission, and typically that will need to be in written form of some sort. Um, what I'd perhaps encourage that person to do is make contact with Wellington City Council's uh, resource consents team, perhaps to discuss their particular situation. Um, yeah. There's a particular reason yeah, with, th right. that they have for having difficulty with a, a written yeah. um, submission. Yeah. And of course they can be uh, writ handwritten or provided electronically. Indeed, yeah. and, and, and in fact um, in, in any, uh, any particular language of New Zealand as well. Right, mm. good. Um, another person wants to know what's the lifespan of the new facility? Mm. So that depends on, on on which part. So typically the structures and things would have a lifespan of 50 years or more, uh, probably closer to 80 years or something like that. It depends. Um, actually what determines the lifespan of those structures is more around... Um, around um, is more around seismic status. So the seismic status sort of dictates how robust it needs to be and then that sort of dictates the age. The mechanical plant in it is on a much shorter lifespan and that's simply because it wears out. A bit like parts in a car would wear out through use, they wear out. So we put them in an asset management program to manage upgrading those. Typically they would last sort of 25 years, uh, but it really again depends on where it is in the plant and what it's being used for uh, and we, we have an asset management program for that, yeah. Right, OK. Amy is asking, is there the possibility for the Moa Point uh, sludge minimisation facility to produce ISSA, incinerated sewage sludge ash? There's no possibility that the process we're putting in will produce uh, sludge ash. It's a completely different process to that. We did consider as one of the many options um, an incinerator as one of the options, and it was ruled out for a whole bunch of reasons um, uh, that I won't go into here. Um, if, if, the, if Amy wants to come and talk to me about the technical options, I'm more than happy to, to spend time with her at the drop-in session and take her through those. Yeah. Right, great. Um, will surplus electricity from the facility be put back into the grid? Uh, in fact, just today I was looking at technical options for that. So we have several options. We can put it back into the grid, we can use it ourselves um, because we, we need electricity to run the Moa Point Wastewater Treatment Plant um, and there are other possibilities sending it to a nearby other consumer. Uh, so I can't answer that question today but it is part of our options and certainly one of the options is just to put it back into the grid. Yeah. Right, great. 
Um, another person's asking, can you tell us a bit more about the lizards and how that will be managed? Paul, that one's for you. <laughs> I, can, I can try. Um, I will caveat my answer by saying I'm not an ecologist, um, but we have had an ecologist do a specialist assessment and, and that is available online uh, if this person uh, does want to find out a bit more. Um, I suppose, as I said, uh, they're, they're very common species throughout uh, the lower North Island. Um, their, their classification status is, as I said, um, not threatened or, or at risk. Um, in terms of, of the numbers, um, we think there's potentially sort of 500 or so um, on, on those slopes towards the back of our site. Um, um, what we are going through with the Department of Conservation um, is a Wildlife Act um, a permitting process that involves us preparing a, a lizard management plan. Um, as I said, my relatively basic understanding of that process is there's a, a salvage uh, exercise that's undertaken, probably for, for a matter of weeks. That can only happen uh, at certain times of the year when lizards are active, so it's not the sort of thing that you can do during winter, um, but fortunately we're, we're coming out of winter. Um, and the, the objective of that exercise is, is obviously to um, gather up as many of those lizard species as possible uh, and release them to an alternative suitable habitat. Uh, and it's you know, really important that uh, we get that habitat right. Uh, the last thing we want to do is you know, release them into a habitat uh, that, that's not going to be suitable for them. Um, but we're really lucky in terms of some of the surrounding area that we have around our site, um, as well as some of the great work that the likes of uh, Predator Firi Miramar have done in terms of reducing um, natural predators for the likes of lizard species. Um, yeah. And that report that you're talking about, uh, that's online with the notice of requirement documents? It is, yep. There's a, an ecological impact assessment is what, the, what you want to look for. OK, great. Mm -hmm. Another person is asking, are the Greater Wellington Consents going to be notified? Yeah, so that, that decision uh, hasn't been made yet. Um, uh, Greater Wellington are, are just considering all of the information. They've asked us for a little bit of uh, additional information and we're just in the process of pulling that together to provide um, and then uh, Greater Wellington Regional Council will make a decision as to whether um, that process will be publicly notified. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, another person is asking, were other locations considered? Yeah, so uh, they were, in fact. Um, so uh, one of the things that Wellingtonians or Wellington really know is that land is not in great supply, uh, and especially for a facility like this, a large um, industrial-type facility like this. Um, and experience from overseas and in and, and New Zealand tells us that um, we... Um, that you want to place the plant as close to where you're producing the sludge as possible. And as I said, that 95% of that sludge is coming from our point. If you don't do that, you need to build pipes to wherever it is, and that's very expensive in urban areas, uh, and, or you need to truck it. And I think we all know from the when the pipes failed in 2020, piping it, uh, or when the pipes fail, having to truck it, are not particularly pleasant options. Um, so for us, uh, it, it arrived in that from our point, but certainly we went through a best practical option assessment, and I would say that there were very limited other options, but we did consider others, yes. Right, okay. Um, somebody is asking, Wellington Airport is going to have a lot of construction going on at the same time. Has the cumulative effect of all construction going on in the area been considered, especially in terms of traffic? Paul? Yeah, so the, the short answer to that is yes. Um, but the, the longer answer is that uh, Wellington City Council and the project have been working closely with the airport for a long time on this. Um, and in particular on the other side of Stuart Duff Drive, um, it, the airport proposes to start construction on a reasonably significant um, uh, freight hub. Um, so particularly in terms of traffic, uh, like, like the question alluded to there, um, we will have requirements in preparing our construction traffic management plan uh, to make sure that in preparing that plan we coordinate closely with Wellington Airport. Uh, and that will also be the case for our construction noise and vibration uh, management plan. What you'll see uh, in our environmental assessment is that uh, in things like our visualisations, which is part of our landscape and visual assessment, uh, you'll see things like that regional freight hub that's proposed on the other side of Stuart Duff Drive. Uh, so 
Uh, where it is relevant to um, consider cumulative effects, then, then yes, we, we've absolutely looked at that. Great. Um, another question here is, will the trucks carrying dried sludge to the southern landfill give off odour? Um, the short answer to that is no, um, or very, very low odour. It's certainly not something you would perceive if, you were, if the truck was coming past you. Even so, we will um, be using trucks that have covers on them and things just to, just to be extra sure, but um, I've been fortunate enough in my career to visit a number of plants overseas that do a similar process to this, and the sludge does, does not smell. And in fact, one of the reasons they've done it overseas is that they want to produce a, a low or no odour product um, for transportation by truck. Uh, so it's one of the great benefits of this new facility. That's a really good thing. Um, what happens to the sludge if the plant fails and can't process the sludge? Will it need to be trucked again? Yeah, so we've been, um, that's a really great question, we've been working through um, a, a bunch of resilience tests on the new facility um, to ensure that under, under, under all scenarios it is, produces a, um, it produces a, uh, we're able to produce a minimum standard of product um, and we have storage provisions within the process so that we can store sludge for a while if we need to fix something on the plant. But we're doing things like putting redundant plant in so that if a piece of plant was to break down, there'd be a second piece of plant. We don't have those single points of failures like those pipelines, which were, uh, uh, were a challenge. And backup yeah. systems in yeah, place. Yeah, we've got backup systems in place, yeah. Right. Um, during the, um, uh, Amy's asking, during the slope stabilisation process, artefacts and mower remains could possibly be recovered as this area was previously used and occupied by Māori uh, pre-1920s and therefore pre-quarry. Do you have any process for how this will be addressed? That would be one for you, Paul. Yeah, good question, Amy. Um, yeah, so we've undertaken an archaeological assessment uh, that was undertaken by Andy Dodd and again that's part of our notice of requirement uh, documentation which is available online. Um, that assessment um, characterised the, the risk or the likelihood of um, uh, unearthing archaeological remains as very low, but of course it can never be discounted. Um, and we've, we've tested that with the likes of Heritage New Zealand uh, and they have agreed that uh, the likelihood is very low and that an archaeological authority uh, isn't, isn't needed on this occasion. Um, but there is still that, that residual effect that you refer to there in the question. And so the way we typically manage that is to have what's known as an accidental discovery protocol. So that will be a condition um, on our designation uh, such that if um, archaeological artefacts are unearthed as part of our earthworks, uh, there's a process in place to stop work, to notify the relevant authorities, that could be um, e iwi um, um, and, and so on, get a trained archaeologist out on site uh, to have a look at what's been unearthed. Right. Mm. OK, mm. so it's covered off. Yeah. Um, somebody else wants to know why are there currently no other plants like this in New Zealand? Mm. Does this uh, pose a risk of a lack of experienced operators? Right, so, um, so this plant is made up of those three process steps that I, that I previously talked to, the thermal hydrolysis, the digestion and the drying. And the, th and the digestion part and the drying plant are used in New Zealand. Um, there are about another five, I think, uh, thermal dryers in New Zealand and there are a number of digester plants. It's the combination of the thermal hydrolysis digester drying which is unique about this. Uh, so there is operational experience about two thirds of this. Um, fortunately while we're producing our plant, uh, building our plant, another one is planned for the North Shore which will come online about the same time. So we've been actively talking to Watercare about how we share operational experience. There's one of these plants in Australia and another two or three I think coming online within the next five years. Um, so we've been actively engaging with both uh, Australia and, and further afield actually around recruiting operational expertise into New Zealand. We're well aware of that and I've written a detailed operational readiness plan to support us getting operators into the country and training local people because uh, we want to create employment uh, opportunities for local people um, and bring them up to speed over the next five years until the plant comes online. Yeah. Right, okay. Um, will the operation of the plant affect the airport? That's one for you Paul. Yeah, certainly. Um, no, it won't. Um, but 
in, in, in order to ensure that, as I um, alluded to before, we've, we have and will continue to work really closely with the airport. Um, there are some really strict civil aviation requirements, um, and you know we, the project is um, needing to be really careful around things like um, maximum heights. And so there are some really strict restrictions on that that we that we need to be within, and then things like uh, reflectivity, so that we don't have glary surfaces that are going to do things like um, uh, create distractions for for pilots and so on. Um, we it's not part of the notice of requirement documentation, uh, but there is a separate um, uh, aeronautical impact study underway at the moment. Um, but yeah, there's a whole layer of Civil Aviation Act uh, requirements uh, that the project needs to meet given its proximity right next to the airport. Mm. Uh, it's, it's an absolute bottom line, obviously, for the project. Yep. Yeah, as you said earlier, safety of the airport operations mm. is paramount. Yes. Yeah. Um, another person is asking what impact will the proposed Three Waters reform have on the project? Yeah, so we've been looking into that, um, and the answer in short to that is, is probably very little impact. I think the biggest one is probably that we're working through who will actually operate the plant, um, because um, we'll be operating under the new NTTB. Um, now, that's being set up in, in 2024. There's a transition unit that is helping support the transition to that, and uh, we have been in communication with them about this project. Um, because this plant doesn't come online until 2026, um, what we're going to do is work through how we would take our operational staff into the new entity so that the plant can be appropriately handed over. But this is a plant that's critical not just for wastewater treatment but also for the waste um, management of Wellington uh, City. So it's critical for that. So this project needs to go ahead um, regards to that water reform. Yeah. Right. Um, Amy's asking, who will be the operators of the sludge management facility and what other projects do they operate in other countries or regions? So um, I can't speak too much to this at the moment because that's subject to a procurement process whereby we need to go and uh, operate identify the operator. Uh, so we're going through an options assessment process and then obviously a commercial process to procure, uh, identify and find and select um, that operator. But one of the things that we will be looking at is the relevant experience of operating similar plants in other countries. Uh, that is obvious, obviously of critical importance. What I would say is we are already engaging some operation specialists from the UK and the USA who are helping us with the uh, design, construction, commissioning of the plant. So we're already beginning to bring that um, in and they will help us with the selection of the operator for this plant. Mm. Yeah. I've got another question for you here, Paul. Are there penguins nesting on the site? We certainly haven't found any to date uh, and we've had our ecologists out there on a number of occasions. Um, that said, we can't completely rule it out. So our approach there is to have a condition um, on our designation uh, such that before we start construction, uh, we need to do a penguin survey by a, a qualified ecologist. Um, and if uh, penguin nests are found, uh, then a, a process kicks into place where I think there's an exclusion of about 100 metres uh, and we, you know, to, to give the penguins time to naturally move on. But um, every indication from our ecologists uh, is that the likelihood is, is really low, but we do have uh, measures in place to, uh, to manage that residual risk. OK, and I think this is another question for you. What are the main environmental benefits of the plant? Yeah, well, I think, you know, they're, they're, they're quite substantial, really, um, both particularly in terms of reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from uh, how we currently dispose. You know, 63% is, is pretty significant, and some of those things that Siobhan spoke to around the city's emission reduction targets and waste minimisation targets. Um, and as Chris spoke to, you know, really this project is about decoupling our current sludge disposal pathway from the landfill, because until we do that, um, the city is actually hamstrung in terms of reducing its solid waste uh, because we've got that four to one ratio. Um, so uh, absolutely massive at that bigger picture. Uh, in terms of more locally, um, uh, you know, uh, removing odour effects at southern landfill associated with Kerry's Gully, um, but also the potential environmental effects that um, local people uh, experienced uh, in 2020 when we had that most recent failure. Um, in terms of that, that pipeline being um, quite fragile. 
So, yeah. Right. And that's a good question to end on, really, as we're coming towards the end of um, the webinar. Before we close tonight's webinar, I just want to remind you of a few things and say a huge namahi uh, thank you to several people. Firstly, um, remember you can hear more about the proposed new facility at the community drop-in meeting on Sunday 18th of September from 11am to 2pm at Raukawa Community Centre in Strathmore Park. You can obtain a submission form online at the Let's Talk Wellington website or by co uh, contacting the Council's planning help desk by phone or email. You can make your submission in written or electronic form, uh, but remember submissions close on Friday, September 23rd. Secondly, thank you um, to our speakers for their time tonight and to the staff who have supported this webinar. A recording will be posted on the Let's Talk Wellington website as soon as possible once it's been edited and captioned. Um, you'll also find on the website more information about the proposed facility, the submission process and answers to the questions we've received during tonight's webinar, including any that we didn't have time to get to. The website address is www.letstalk.com dot wellington dot govt dot nz forward slash smf hyphen notice hyphen of hyphen requirement. Finally, thank you for attending tonight, for listening to our speakers and for your questions. We really appreciate and value your participation. Good evening. Kia pai te pol.